Good evening. This is VK3 Echo Kilo Hotel, the official station of the Astronomical Society of Victoria with the regular Friday night broadcast coming to you from the studios of VK3 CSJ in Nary Warren South. Very pleasant good evening to folks that are tuning in for the first time and to the regular crowd that uh, comes along at this time on a Friday night. Here it is at the end of the month, another month, and coming into a new month. So, just as a uh, precursor, this uh, Sunday we're turning our clocks back to standard time, one hour back. So, uh, we have to get used to that, but it'd be nice to uh, have a little bit of daylight back in the mornings. I really do miss that. You're tuned to ASV Radio. We're broadcasting on the prime frequency of 3541 kHz in the 80 metre amateur radio band. We're also broadcasting via the Melbourne television repeater, VK3RTV Digital Channel 1. Pleasant uh, v- evening to the viewers there. <coughs> We're also on our stream channel uh, on the YouTube uh, uh, medium. So if you uh, haven't seen that one uh, yet, there's a hair on my shirt there, that's better. Um, If you haven't seen that one yet, just go to the uh, YouTube search engine and type in VK3CSJ and look for the the live symbol. We're also doing something a little bit different, uh, not well, it's not different, but uh, (laughs) um, uh, courtesy uh, of uh, Mark Oscario, he's uh, added uh, a uh, uh, inclusion to our uh, scrolling a browser on the ASV uh, website which now has the uh, reference to the Friday night session which uh, some of you may have seen and if I do this it might come up and there it is uh, so uh, that's really cool the background picture is uh, just a, a temporary one for the time being uh, until we find something a little bit more appropriate for the ham radio aspect of the hobby but the radios is pretty good anyway so thanks Mark for uh, for putting this uh, up there on the, the home page of the ASV um, it's probably well and truly overdue for that little bit of recognition so hopefully we'll, we've got some new people watching tonight uh, here on a, on a Friday night anyway uh, we've got a, an action packed if you want to call it that for uh, this Friday night there's a few articles for me uh, to uh, read out and hopefully you'll be um, uh, educated through it one way or another um, okay uh, what's the other thing I was going to say oh there I, I may not do a broadcast next uh, Friday being Easter Friday and the on, the long weekend as such so I might uh, I might decide to have uh, next Friday uh, off as respect so we'll uh, we'll see about that anyway but I'll make another comment towards the end of tonight's session the astronomical the astronomical society of victoria uh, was founded in 1922 comprises well over 1600 members scattered about the country and overseas membership of the society is open to all persons with an interest in astronomy the society's objectives are to encourage the study and practice of astronomy to disseminate the knowledge of the science and to provide greater facilities for the study among its members. Monthly meetings are usually held on the second Wednesday of each month except in January where the latter held on a Saturday night. Meetings start at 8pm in the Mullier Hall, Burwood Avenue, Melbourne near the Melbourne Observatory which is located not too far from the Shrine of Remembrance. Parking is available Burwood Avenue, Dallas Brooks Drive and the surrounding streets. Admission is free and visitors are most welcome. Privileges of membership include the right to borrow books, periodicals and other publications from the Society's extensive library located at Melbourne Observatory. Receipt of the ASV magazine Crux containing articles, news, observing notes and the like. And the free provision of the astronomical yearbook. Access is available to telescopes on members nights held regularly at the Melbourne Observatory and after the monthly meetings weather permitting. These instruments include the Society's 300mm equatorial reflector and a 300mm portable reflector. There's also a 200mm refractor managed by the Royal Botanic Gardens 
and a photoheliograph are also housed at the observatory as well. The Society also has a number of 200mm reflectors available for short, short period loan so members can try before they buy. Members are also encouraged to make use of the Society's country property located near Heathcote, some 90 minute drive north of Melbourne. There are a range of instruments available for members to use, the larger two requiring appropriate training, which range from 300mm to 1000mm in aperture. We also have on the site an 8.5 fully steerable radio telescope which members can access with involvement with the radio astronomy section. Members are encouraged to make and use telescopes. Advice and help on both matters are provided willingly to newcomers desiring to do the same. Instrument making is only one of the number of common interest activities catered for within the society. Other areas of interest that members can participate in including deep sky observing, astrophotography, lunar and planetary observing, auroral, meteor, comet, radio astronomy, computing, cosmology and astrophysics, historical studies and research in general, astronomy in general. Contact details for various section directors are provided in the yearbook. Uh, further information may be obtained by visiting the ASV website and notifications of events are given in the Crux Extra bulletins sent out via email to members every other week. Please note that ASV will conform to all government health directives. ASV events may be required to be cancelled, moved or postponed. Further information may be obtained by writing to the Secretary, the Astronomical Society of Victoria, GPO Box 1059, Melbourne, Victoria 3001. That's the Secretary, Astronomical Society of Victoria, GPO Box 1059, Melbourne, Victoria 3001. Although the website is equally just as good to go to, and you can find all information uh, about the society and contact details for just about everybody, almost, uh, at www.asv.org.au. That's www.asv.org.au. And uh, I will also throw in this next paragraph. The Astronomical Society of Victoria would like to say that in the spirit of reconciliation, we acknowledge the traditional custodians of the country throughout Australia and their connections to the land, sea and community. And we pay our respect to the elders past, present and extend their respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples of today. One of those little necessary things to mention from time to time. Uh, okay, now um, you're tuned to ASV Radio, VK3 Echo Kilo Hotel, and I'm just going to turn the volume down on a radio that behind me that likes to make a little bit of noise from time to time. Um, so I won't turn it right down there, Richard. For some reason, it wants to make the occasional noise. And uh, it's just a, a bit of a, a nuisance factor to this transmission. <laughs> uh, dear. Anyways, all right, time is eight past the hour. We also have a Discord channel. I keep forgetting to mention this. Uh, a dis Discord chat room. Um, yeah, we need to organise this. We still haven't quite organised how to refer to the link, but I know that everybody know, who knows how to get to the uh, to the chat room uh, knows how to do it. And uh, I can see that we've already got uh, a few folks there. Uh, Martin, VK7JH, down in Tasmania. Uh, Bill, VK3KHT, is there. Richard, VK3VRS. Cassiopeia, or Nebs, a member of the society there. Uh, Mitch VK3ZT has also arrived and we also have uh, Steve VK3SPX all on the chat, Discord chat window. <coughs> the S the uh, ASV's website is going through uh, a refreshing change uh, at this stage. Uh, that we do plan to uh, introduce a separate little page for uh, the ASV broadcast um, which will have uh, all the necessary information about uh, how to, to see, get to these links and the YouTube link as well. In fact, if you click on, currently if you do lick, click, if you do lick on the uh, browser, the, um, 
the revolving browser on the home page it has my reference to the broadcast that'll actually open up to a YouTube link I forgot to mention that before uh, but that will open up to uh, my YouTube channel so well, just look for the live symbol we will see if we can clean that up as well a little bit too perhaps um, and an email address. We also have an active email address, vk3ekh at gmail.com, vk3ekh at gmail.com, which is, uh, I can see that Don, vk3hdx, has already uh, sent us a, an email. He says, uh, hitting the audio a little hard on 80 metres tonight. Am I really? Um, wouldn't surprise me, but... Uh, um, I've actually got the AGC turned off tonight because it just brings up the background noise. Um, so uh, I don't seem to be peaking too much on the on that meter. So I can probably just knock down the the audio on the main transmitter a little bit, and uh, maybe that will fix that a bit. Perhaps, maybe, maybe, perhaps. Okay. Well, being uh, uh, coming into the uh, beginning of the month, uh, of course we have um, oh. The other thing I wanted to mention too, um, this is interesting, uh, the Astronomical Society of Victoria in conjunction with the radio, with the Royal Botanic Gardens of Victoria would like to announce the return of Melbourne Observatory Tours. I'm not 100% sure if this is going to be open to uh, to the public or whether this is just members only at this stage, but this is on the Facebook page that I'm looking at at the moment, which anybody can see. <clears throat> uh, so uh, over the coming weeks, the two organisations will work together or work through and agree on dates when Melbourne Observatory can again be opened up to the public for tours uh, by our trained demonstrators. We understand there has been significant interest over the, the last few years and asked for continued patience as we work through the finalisation of agreements um, that will allow the observatory to reopen. So uh, keep an eye out for further updates and ticketing to be released on all our social media pages and uh, we, as, uh, as they say here, we cannot wait to bring you the night skies of Melbourne Observatory again, which will be uh, pretty cool. So that, that's uh, something worthwhile to, uh, to keep in the back of the mind there. All right. Um, now, Sky Notes. Thanks to Dr. Tanya Hill, resident astronomer, at the Science Works Planetarium. Every month she composes the Sky Notes for the following month. And for this month, uh, she writes... Okay, she starts... Actually, she starts right off with the Sunrise Times. Now, this, of course, is going to be mucked up a little bit because daylight saving is changing. So, uh, from Saturday, this is how it's going to go. From tomorrow, sunrise is at 7.33, setting at 7.14. But come Monday morning, sorry, Monday the 11th, <laughs> at least, sunrise will be at 6.42 and setting at 5.59. So our evenings are going to get darker. But I think I can put up with that because I really do prefer a little bit of extra light in the mornings now that I'm back at work full time. But that's not the story. Uh, on Friday the 21st, you've got sunrise at 6.51, setting at 5.45. And then by the end of the month on the 30th, Sunday the 30th, uh, sunrise will be at 6.59, setting at 5.34. PM. So the, the month starts off with a, an average day length of 11 hours and 40 minutes. By the end of the month it'll be down to 10 hours and 35 minutes. So there it is. And she indicates here that daylight savings ends at 3am Sunday 2nd of April with the clocks turning back one hour. Uh, yeah, okay. Moon phases for this following month. Uh, there will be a full moon on Thursday the 6th of April. 
There's a third quarter on Thursday the 13th. There's a new moon on Thursday the 20th. And then it's a first quarter on Friday the 28th. Moon distances, for those interested to, interested to know how far and how close the moon will be. On the 16th of April, <clears throat> Sunday the 16th, the moon will be closest to Earth at 3,667, get it right, Clem, 367,968 kilometres. And uh, on Friday the 28th of April, it'll be the furthest from Earth at 404,000 kilometres and 299. Planets, what's happening with our planets for this month? <sighs> Tickle on my nose here. Mercury is an evening planet this month, but not able to be seen from Melbourne. Venus will be visible this month in the northwest from 6 p.m. before setting by 7:40 p.m. Mars will be in the north from 6:30 p.m. until 10 p.m. when it will set in the northwest. Jupiter has taken its journey behind the sun, but it is still too close to the sun to be seen at this stage. Saturn, like Jupiter, has passed behind the sun but will be visible from around 2.30 a.m. in the east before fading by 6 a.m. in the early morning light. Meteors. April's main shower, the Lyrids, is centred near the bright star Vega, low in the north at 3 a.m. It is active from the 16th to the 25th, peaking on the 22nd to 23rd of April. Better placed is the Pie Puppets associated with Comet Grig Sturup, which peaks on 24th, centred low in the southwest near Canopus in Carina. So there's two showers this uh, month, the Lyrids, Lyrids and the Pie Puppets, all basically towards the end of the month there. Stars and constellations. I always trip over the, this one because of the Latin words they use, but I always find it amusing. Stars and constellations in the south. The Southern Cross can be found on its side in the southeast with the two pointers below. To the right of the cross in the southwestern sky is the star Canopus the second brightest star in the night sky. Low in the south is Achenar, the head of the river Arindernus. Achenar never sits in Melbourne, never, sorry, Achenar never sets in Melbourne as it is called a circumpolar star as moves through the half circle around the south celestial pole during the night as Earth rotates on its axis. Here is a superb view of the special place in the night sky taken by the AAT, the Anglo-Australian Telescope. And actually, I'll bring up, there's a picture here. I think they're referring to this picture. Uh, where are you? Where are you? There's a picture here somewhere of this. There it is. Okay, it's the Southern Cross and the Pointers and the Coal Sack. They're making reference here too. Here is a, a superb view of a special place in the night sky taken by the Anglo-Australian Telescope. Forms part of the Southern Cross and the Pointers. Forms part of the Australian Telescope Observatory, AAO, at Siding Spring in New South Wales, which hosts a variety of telescopes and detectors studying the sky. The image reveals a region of the galaxy densely packed with millions of stars and reveals their colours which, seen in long exposures like this one, indicates a star surface temperature, blue for hottest stars and orange-yellow for the cooler ones. The dark coal sack dust cloud sits at the centre with the five stars of the Southern Cross above and to the right. 
At the left are the two pointers, Alpha and Beta Centauri, with the brighter at the far left being Alpha Centauri, the nearest star system to our own. The Colsac, uh, which is that dark region, pretty much in the middle of that image, once upon a time used to be seen from Melbourne, but unfortunately uh, uh, starlight, uh, city light, street lighting, uh, has destroyed a lot, of, a lot of the visibility for these finer details. But you've only got to go out of Melbourne, the city area, by at least an hour's drive to a dark sky site or a location but not affected by street lighting, city lighting, and the coal sack begins to be quite obviously seen. I still remember the first time I actually saw that after a long, 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 long time uh, at a uh, uh, star party up at uh, Heathcote, the dark sky site, and I was quite gobsmacked, to use that expression, uh, as to how obvious the coal sack was. So, uh, pretty, pretty amazing stuff. Beautiful star field, isn't it? All right, back to me. Uh, so, uh, in the southwest, if you are away from bright city lights, just as I mentioned, you can see the large and small clouds of Magellan, two small neighbouring galaxies, uh, two to our own Milky Way. They appear as irregular fuzzy patches isolated away from the broad band of stars that runs across the sky and is our edge on view of our own galaxy. It's less light polluted skies you can easily see in, in the Milky Way, several dark regions that are vast clouds of dust. Whilst we may see a few foreground stars, the dark areas behind obscure our view of the more distant stars of the galaxy. The obvious dark one adjacent to the cross is the coal sack. In the west, Orion the Hunter is in the west lying almost on its on his side with the red giant star Betelgeuse as one of his shoulders. The three bright stars that form an obvious line are Alnicta, Alnilmla and Mintika. I can never pronounce those words. They mark his belt and also conveniently the base of the social, sorry, the local <laughs> saucepan asterism. The handle of the saucepan is Orion's scabbard or sword, which hangs from his belt, continuing the belt stars above and a little to the right, which, which uh, uh, right we reach Cirrus, the brightest star in the night sky and principal star in Kansas Major which is one of Orion's hunting dogs. Below Cirrus, in the northwest, is Procyon, which marks the position of his lesser of the smaller dog, Kansas Minor. Below Orion, and drawing closer to the horizon during the month, is the Hades, an open group of stars that forms a sideways wedge, or V, this is the triangular head of Taurus the Bull, which is my star sign, <laughs> with his angry eye as the red giant star Aldebaran on the corner. Bless his heart, good old Taurus. In the north part of the sky, in the north but upside down from the southern hemisphere perspective is Leo the Lion. This constellation is easily recognised by the hook shape or the inverted backwards question mark of stars that forms the mane on the lion's head and shoulders. To the left of Leo and close together are two bright stars, Castor and Pollux, the principal stars in the constellation of Gemini, the twins, which appears upside down as well from southern latitudes. Looking east, later this month and into May, the spectacular constellation of Scorpius will begin its return to the, our evening skies. Amazing part of the sky. This area of the sky, you are actually looking towards the centre of our galaxy. This is one of the largest constellations 
and when it appears low in the east you can easily identify to the to the left its long curving tail leading to its body containing a red red giant star Antares marking its heart and to the right is the pin pinches reaching out now moving along this is VK3 EKH the official station of the Astronomical Society of Victoria with the regular Friday night broadcast there's a few other emails that have just arrived I'll get to those in a moment uh, Blue Walker 3 Satellite ok let's see what she's on about here a private communications satellite by AST Space Mobile was launched by Falcon 9 rocket on the 11th of September to 2022 to low to a low earth orbit of 500 kilometers with a mass of 1500 kilogram and a deployed size of 8 by 8 meters Blue Walker 3 has been developed to enhance broadband and mobile phone coverage its flat panel antenna array of 64 square meters is larger than many objects in orbit. Its brightness or magnitude overhead is regularly observed to be equivalent to or greater than the International Space Station, the largest object in Earth orbit. Its high reflectivity while in sunlight is being closely monitored by the space and astronomy community for its effects on stargazing or astronomical research. The company plans to launch at least 100 similar satellites to low or Earth orbit over the next 20 months. Other satellite constellations such as Starlink have already appeared in low Earth orbit, orbit and are being assessed for the same reasons. Yes, not good. Skynotes visited the issue in April 2020. Satellites, we need them, but problems are coming. It's a link. It's a link. Okay. The International Space Station. <coughs> the ISS orbits every 90 minutes at an average distance of 400 kilometers above the Earth, appearing like a bright star moving slowly across the night sky. Here are some brightest passes expected this month over Melbourne and Central Victoria. On the morning of Saturday the 8th of April, you'll see a passing at 6.02 a.m. to 6.06 a.m. coming in from the southwest to the northeast. On Monday the 9th of April, there will be a passing at 5.16 a.m. to 5.20 a.m. coming in from the southwest to the north to the east-northeast. And then on the evening of Sunday the 16th of April, there's a passing at 7.26pm to 7.29pm coming in from the northwest to the east-northeast. And then on Wednesday the 19th, there's a passing at 6.35pm to 6.42pm west-northwest to south-east. If you go to the website Heavens Above, Heavens Above gives predictions for visible passes of space stations and major satellites, live sky views and 3D visualizations. Be sure to first enter your location under the configuration uh, settings so that you can get accurate locations for, pa um, uh, for passings. But Heavens Above is a great site because not only does it give you uh, predictions, well not predictions, but the passings of satellites of all sorts, uh, but uh, also uh, uh, celestial bodies too. So it's a, a fantastic website, Heavens Above. Heavens Above. All right, it's 28 past the hour, coming up to 29. Half an hour has gone past pretty quickly. I'm just going to throw in a few dates here. Uh, on the 1st of April 1948, Alpha, Beth and Gamal published their famous paper on the Hot Big Bang. On the 2nd of April 1845, Fitzhugh and Falkolt take the first photograph of the Sun. I think I got that pronounced right. don't know. On the 3rd of April 1966, Luna 10 USSR became the first spacecraft to orbit the Moon. 
On the 6th of April 1973, Pioneer 11 probe launched to Jupiter and Saturn. On the 8th of April 1732, the birth of David Rittenhouse, who determined Earth-Sun distance of 150 million kilometres. 1732. On the 9th of April 1959, NASA's first cohort of astronauts, the Mercury 7, are announced. And on the 11th of April 1905, Einstein's special theory of relativity is published. Einstein. Also on the 11th of April 1970, uh, Apollo 13 was launched on its ill-fated mission, starring Tom Hanks. <laughs> That's the movie, but yeah, 1970. Uh, on the 12th of April, 1633, Galileo's trial by the Catholic Inquisition on the question of the sun-centered solar system begins in Rome. Oh dear, but we had to go through it. Uh, and one more date. On the tw- also on the 12th of April, 1961, Yuri Gagarin became the first human in space orbiting Earth for 108 minutes in Vostok 1. There's a whole heap of other dates there, but we'll go through those next, well, in the next next broadcast. Righto, you're tuned to ASV Radio, VK3EKH. Just looking at these other dates, actually there's quite a few interesting things there. I could go through them all, but I shan't. Uh, all right, let's get on to the first article before it gets the hour gets away from us. Um, just saying, g- yeah, g'day to Andrew, uh, VK3KIS. He's watching YouTube and listening on 80 meters. G'day, uh, Andrew. Uh, Stephen, uh, he says, I'm 30 over 9 in barring up tonight. And... Uh, Don sent another email there, but I'm not sure what you're saying there, Don. Ian, um, your audio is certainly different. Your audio is certainly different, he says. Well, I hope it's not uh, too bad. Uh, I, the last look, the last couple of uh, broadcasts, I've, um, I've had the AGC selected in vMix, and it's just produced a bit of an issue here because I've got so much background noise. So I've just got it turned off, and I've got the gain up to compensate a little bit, so maybe it might be a little bit too much gain, I don't know. Anyway, all right, no worries, we're aware of it. (sighs) And we're still on the repeater. Okay, (laughs) what is it? Okay, just checking that time. Now, this article, this article, it's not very long, courtesy of astronomy.com. A space lawyer and a planetary scientist discuss the challenges facing nations as humans return to the moon. A US-led coalition and China are both planning to establish bases on the moon. How the two nations will navigate actions on the moon and how other countries will be involved is still unclear. NASA is planning to put US astronauts back on the surface of the moon by the end of 2024. This mission is just the beginning of what is shaping up to be a historic few decades in space exploration. In both the US and China have plans to establish permanent human presence on the moon. So the first question you might have is, why? Why now? The short answer is the relatively recent discovery of water on the moon. But the deeper and perhaps more important questions have to be or have to do with how competing space agencies will pull off this feat given the limited resources on Earth's satellite. When Apollo astronauts brought back the first lunar rocks in the late 1960s, and early 1970s, scientists were disappointed to find no sign of water or anything of much use in the samples. The moon looked to be a barren place. Fast forward a few decades, and two coincidence uh, events, coinciding events, got that right, reshaped the future of the moon. 
the sudden boom in the private space sector and the discovery of water frozen in permanently shadowed craters on the moon's surface all of the sudden setting up a base on the moon was not only desirable but feasible too and there's an image here that I've got of where they see this this water and for those watching ATV repeater and YouTube all that blue colored area in the north and south poles uh, of uh, the moon uh, regions where there's potential for uh, water ice uh, research has found evidence of water in the form of ice shown in blue frozen in craters around the moon's poles if you want to explore space with humans water becomes one of the most critical comedies explains Makesh a professor of planetary science and exploration at the Open University in the UK we need water to survive but water can also be split into its individual components like oxygen which we need to breathe but there are many other resources on the moon as Makesh explains water is where the story begins but it doesn't end there utilizing resources in situ uh, where you are that's what is actually opening up the field of lunar exploration the US Artemis program which had its first launch in 2022 is the beginning of a plan to eventually build a base on the surface of the moon as well as a space station in orbit around it the US and its collaborators are not alone in these lunar ambitions China too has plans to establish a permanent presence on the moon before 2030 and both groups explicitly plan to use lunar resources to accomplish these goals how this all works legally is an open question and is being debated right now in international venues like the United Nations but there are some agreements on the books already it's fun to think about space as being the Wild West with no rules but it's not we do have other space treaty explains Michelle Hanlon a law professor of the University of Mississippi in the unit in the US this treaty has been signed by many countries and lays out an almost utopian framework of how nations are supposed to act in space the main provisions of the outer space treaty says says that space is not for everybody nobody can claim any territory in space it's free for ex exploration and use by all and the moon and all other celestial sh bodies shall be used exclusively for peaceful purposes the high-minded detail ideals of space law are, are quickly heading toward a, co a collision with the treaty sorry <laughs> with the reality of humanity expanding off earth and bringing all other geopolitics and competing interests with us listen to the full episode to learn how nations are navigating the big scientific and legal moral questions of a lunar future and that that last sentence is referring to a uh, an audio recording uh, in the uh, something called the conversation weekly if you've ever heard of that um, search for the conversation weekly and there is a episode uh, of uh, this discussion that's going on it goes for about 45 uh, minutes all right I'm gonna have to pick and choose my articles I, I think um, you're tuned to ASV Radio, VK3 Echo Kilo Hotel. Uh, fast radio burst. This shouldn't take long, it's mostly pictures. Um, as you know, we progressively always uh, have been talking about fast radio bursts. It's become a, a very popular thing over the last few years. And there's uh, whenever I see an article... Um, on it I always like to uh, to talk about it so fast radio bursts linked with gravitational waves for the first time for years astronomers have been detecting incredibly powerful pulses from the cosmos without a confirmed source recent advances in astronomy are getting us closer to the solution 
We have just published evidence in Nature Astronomy for what might be producing mysterious bursts of radio waves coming from distant galaxies known as fast radio bursts, or FRBs. Two colliding neutron stars, each the super-dense core of an exploded star, produced a burst of gravitational waves when they merged into a supermassive neutron star. We found that two and a half hours later, they produced an FRB when the neutron star collapsed into a black hole. Or so we think. The key piece of evidence that would confirm or refute our theory, an optical or gamma ray flash coming from the direction of the fast radio burst, vanished almost four years ago. In a few months, we might get another chance to find out if we are correct. FRBs are incredibly powerful pulses of radio waves from space lasting about a thousandth of a second. Using data from a radio telescope in Australia, the Australian Square Kilometre Array Pathfinder, or ASCAP, astronomers have found that most FRBs come from galaxies so distant, light takes a billions of years to reach us. But what produces these radio wave bursts has been puzzling astronomers since the initial detection back in 2007. The best clue comes from an object in our galaxy known as SGR 1935 plus 2154. It's a magnetar, which is a neutron star with magnetic fields about a trillion times stronger than a fridge magnet. Okay. On April 28, 2020, it produced a violent burst of radio waves similar to an FRB although less powerful. Astronomers have long predicted that two neutron stars, a binary, merging to produce a black hole should also produce a burst of radio waves. The two neutron stars will be highly magnetic and black holes cannot have magnetic fields. The idea is the sudden vanishing of magnetic fields when the neutron stars merge and collapse to a black hole produces a fast radio burst. Changing magnetic fields produce electric fields. It's how the most powerful stations produce electricity. And the huge change in magnetic fields at the time of collapse could produce the intense electro electromagnetic fields of a fast radio burst. And there's an artist's impression here. I'll just bring up that picture of the artist's impression. Okay. <clears throat> artist's impression of a fast radio burst traveling through space and reaching Earth. There it is. <laughs> Continuing on. The search for the smoking gun. To test this idea, Alexandra Morianu a master's student at the University of Western Australia, looked for merging neutron stars detected by the Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory, or LIGO, in the US. The gravitational waves LIGO searches for are ripples in space-time, produced by collisions of two massive objects such as neutron stars. LIGO has found two binary neutron star mergers. Crucially, the second, known as GW190425, occurred when a new FRB hunting telescope called CHIME, C-H-I-M-E, was also operational. However, being new, it took CHIME two years to release its first batch of data. When it did so, Morianu quickly identified a fast radio burst called FRB 20190425A, which occurred only two and a half hours after GW190425. Exciting as this was, there was a problem. Only one of LIGO's two detectors was working at the time, making it very uncertain where exactly GW190425 had come from. In fact, 
there was a 5% chance that this could just be a coincidence. And let me show you a picture of the CHIME telescope. This is CHIME. I think that's an artist's drawing as well. I don't think that's a real image there, but CHIME does look like that. CHIME stands for, it's an acronym, CHIME stands for the Canadian Hydrogen Intensity Mapping Experiment and uh, has turned out to be uniquely suited to detecting FRBs, it seems. So, uh, yes, LIGO has found two binary neutron star mergers. Okay, just read that. Exciting as this was, <sighs> yes, exciting as this was, there was a problem. Only one of LIGO's two detectors was working at the time. Yes, I've read that out. Worse, the Fermi satellite, which could have detected gamma ray from the merger, the smoking gun, confirming the origin of JW190425, was blocked by Earth at the time. So, however, the critical clue was that FRBs trace the total amount of gas they have passed through. We know this because high frequency radio waves travel faster through gas than low frequency waves, so the time difference between them tells us the amount of gas. Because we know the average gas density of the universe, we can relate this gas content to distance, which is known as the Marquent relation. Marquent, Marquent relation. And the distance travelled by FRB 2190425A <coughs> was a near perfect match for the distance to GW190425. Bingo, they say here. <coughs> Excuse me. So, have we discovered the source of all FRBs? Question mark. Well, no. There are not enough merging neutron stars in the universe to explain the number of FRBs. Some must still come from magnetars, like SGR 1935 plus 2154 did. And even with all the evidence, there's still a 1 in 200 chance this could all be a giant coincidence. However, LIGO and two other gravitational wave detectors, Virgo and Kara, Karaga, Kara, K A G R A, uh, will turn back on in May this year and more sensitive than ever, while Chime and other radio telescopes are ready to immediately detect any FRBs from neutron star mergers. In a few months, we may find out if we've made any key breakthrough or if it was just a flash in the pan there it is that's courtesy of astronomy.com and uh, the search for the reasons for fast radio burst continues you're tuned to ASV radio VK3 Echo Kilo Hotel Just checking this next article here. I might jump to the next one. No, this one. No, there was another one that has a video in it. Yeah, okay. All right, kind of uh, in the similar vein to the last article. Uh, okay. Uh, the most powerful explosion ever seen in space was too bright to accurately measure. March 30. And this, there's an image here which I'll bring up. Did I put that here in my collection of images? Why didn't I do that? It's always I, I always leave out an image. That's so annoying. It doesn't matter. So, shine bright like a gamma ray. Shine bright like a gamma ray, question mark. A gamma ray burst that recently hit our solar system was so bright it temporarily blinded gamma ray instruments in space, according to NASA release. Scientists say the gamma ray burst, GRB, the most powerful type of explosion in the universe, was 70 times brighter than any previously recorded event. It was dubbed the boat, or brightest of all time. Astronomers and their acronyms, I tell you. A GRB is basically a black hole. 
A GRB is basically a black hole's first breath into existence, and it's a spectacular one. When a supermassive star nears the end of its life, when it's no longer generating enough fuel in its core to support its sheer mass, it collapses under its own weight, forming a black hole. Now there's a little video which I'll run here while I'm talking. And I think that's, where is it? This one here. Okay. And I think I've got it on the loop. Yep. All right. Two things happen during this process. First, the collapse generates an explosion called a supernova. Second, the resulting black hole is born into a massive cloud of residual gas and dust, where it proceeds to quickly gobble it all up. What comes next has been observed many times, but is still a scientific mystery as to why it happens. The black hole burps out two powerful jets of high energy gamma radiation traveling at near the speed of light in opposite directions. These cos cosmic belches only last for a few seconds, but are so bright that astronomers have documented about 12,000 GRBs, and it's one of these jets that struck our solar system last, last winter. The burst classified as GRB 221009A was recorded on October 9, 2022. Because it blinded space instruments, they couldn't accurately record it, so scientists weren't sure how bright the burst was when it first reached our planet. For the last several months, scientists worldwide, including the US, China and Russia, have accumulated data from other instruments to measure and remeasure the GRB's brightness, determining it was 70 times brighter than any other GRB event in recorded history. And I shall go to another image here. Um, where's this other image? Oh, I can't see it. I'll go back to the article. Now, I did, I'm pretty sure I saved that image here. There's a, there's a little graph here. And for some reason I didn't. I'll, I'll just... I know where it is. Image, browse, there it is open okay click there click there okay <laughs> sorry about that uh, okay so uh, what you're looking at there uh, the amount of gamma ray radiation from GRB 2210098 a is significantly greater than any other GRB on record and this graph here uh, gives you a bit of a, a reference or an idea of just how intense that uh, particular uh, gamma ray burst was. So it was 70 times brighter than any other GRB event re in recorded history. Researchers also examined the likelihood of an event like this happening again and reported that this sort of thing only occurs once every 10,000 years. GRB 22109A was likely to be the brightest burst at X-ray and gamma ray energies to occur since the human civilization began, said Eric Burns, an assistant professor of physics and astronomy at Louisiana State University. Oddly enough, the jets themselves weren't the most powerful on record. What made GRB so bright was the fact that the jets were narrow and aimed directly at Earth. So, we got a full-on view of it, sort of like a deer in headlights. <laughs> Ah uh, dear, yes, pardon the pun. Um, other GRBs aren't aimed directly at Earth, so we don't detect as much of their radiation as they appear dimmer. The researchers recently announced their findings in the American Astronomical Society's High Energy Astrophysics Division and published the results in Astrophysical Journal Letters. But astronomers aren't done. They're hopeful that this GRB could help solve the mystery of why black holes burp. Our gamma ray bursts in the first place. One theory is already in place that jets were powered by a magnetic field that the black hole amplified as it began its spin. Yes, black holes can spin. 
So that article was courtesy of sciencealert.com. Sciencealert.com. Okay, we're coming up to 11 o'clock there. And I had so much more there. Uh, that would probably take me five minutes to read that one. I'll leave that till later. And there was a bright solar flare. So I'll, I'll, le I'll read this out leading into spaceweather.com, I think. Yeah. Okay, and there is an image here I should have. Yes, there it is. Bring that up. There it is. Extreme X-Class solar flare hits Earth, causing radio blackout, March 31. A powerful solar flare flashed at Earth on Tuesday, spending, sending an eruption of X-ray and ultraviolet radiation to our planet at the speed of light. It was an X-Class flare, the most powerful kind, and it caused a radio blackout for about one hour on the day side of Earth in parts of Southeast Asia, Australia and New Zealand. That's because the extreme solar radiation ionized parts of our planet's upper atmosphere, degrading the high-frequency radio waves that travel there. The, the flare occurred at 10.33 p.m. ET on Tuesday. This eruption follows a series of powerful events on the Sun, on the sun including two giant coronal holes and series of eruptions that caused northern lights to appear in skies as far south as Arizona, not to mention the South Pole. This may be a precursor to even more solar activity in coming days. And there's another image here. It's a beautiful shot of uh, the sun with this lovely flare. There it is in another wavelength of light. The sun has already produced three moderate M-class flares, one level below X-class, in the past day, according to Thursday report from Space Weather Prediction Center of the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. That report forecasts a chance of more M-class flares in the coming days, with the slight chance of another X-class flare on Thursday. A space weather forecast from the UK's Met Office also warned that more moderate flares are possible over the next two days due to a large active group of sunspots facing Earth. Sunspots are small, dark regions where surface temperatures are lower than the surrounding plasma. Tuesday's eruption was the seventh X-class solar flare so far this year, suggesting solar activity in 2023 will far surpass 2022, which saw seven class flares in total. According to spaceweather.com, a blog that tracks daily government data on the sun and its impacts on Earth's atmosphere. Through Thursday, flare, though, th though Tuesday's flare was powerful, it was on the lower end of the X-class flares. It was ranked as an X1.2 but the Sun is capable of producing flares as big as X-28, which can be devastating to technologies on Earth. In addition to radio blackouts, flares and other solar eruptions can cause power blackouts, knock satellites out of orbit, and confuse GPS systems. More often, though, solar activity triggers energetic displays of northern lights and southern lights, of aurora borealis and aurora australis, sometimes pushing them further south than their normal Arctic occurrence. More solar flares and eruptions are in store and will probably increase in frequency as our star ramps up its peak of its 11th year sol cycle in 2025. <sighs> there it is. Okay, where's my camera? There's my camera. You're tuned to ASV Radio, VK3 Echo Kilo Hotel, the official station of the Astronomical Society of Victoria, coming to you from the studios of VK3 CSJ in Narry Warren South. The solar wind is currently at 585.8 kilometres a second. It is blowing a gale. At a density of 0.21 protons per cubic centimetre, The disk of the sun, which is this beautiful image, this is the current disk of the sun as we speak. 
we have at least one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, I think it is. Eight sunspots on that disk of the sun facing our side at the moment. Sun, the, sun, the current sunspot number is 99. The radio sun, measured at a wavelength of 10.7 centimetres, is currently at 140 solar flux units. 140 solar flux units. The planetary K index, the uh, current KP index is 3, which is considered quiet. But the 24-hour max KP figure is looking at 4.67 and unsettled. Okay. The solar wind has arrived. Earth is entering a stream of solar wind flowing at 600 kilometers a second from a small hole in the southern atmosphere. The sorry, <laughs> from a small hole in the sun's atmosphere. Minor G1 class geomagnetic storms are possible on March 31 and Arctic sky watchers should be alert for auroras. In fact I do have the current auroral image here over the South Pole. There she blows. So that's what the uh, the aurora australis currently looks like. The aurora ring over the Antarctica. It's got a slight emphasis towards um, towards uh, sat, um, truth towards Tasmania that's what I was trying to say so uh, yeah there should be some small chances of aurora being visible but probably not so intense at the moment like it has been as far as near-earth asteroids are concerned potentially hazardous asteroids are space rocks larger than approximately 100 meters and that can come close to earth to 0.05 AU but none of the, the none of the known PHAs is on a collision course with our planet so don't stress on March 31 2023 there were 2327 potentially hazardous asteroids always love that figure I think that's about it for the solar space weather uh, brief as such so uh, I think that shall conclude tonight's news broadcast. I hope you have all found something there of interest. The articles uh, are courtesy of astronomy.com, spacealert.com. Uh, <coughs> and the articles I left out tonight, which just didn't have time for, are four, four volcanic hotspots, four volcanic hot spots in our solar system that was it had some very interesting pictures associated with that also uh, the earliest supermassive black hole ever found has just been spotted that was an interesting article and uh, no I've already read that one so there it is <laughs> so I'll, I'll leave those over till our next broadcast which uh, I shall yes um, which won't be next Friday I will take next Friday off courtesy of the Easter break so uh, I shan't be here on the 7th of April but I shall do the following Friday uh, which will be the 14th so I shall be back on the 14th of April at 10 o'clock on 3541 and through the Melbourne TV repeater and on YouTube and if I can get my act together in the next two weeks I might be able to also produce my simulcast missions on 1865 kilohertz and uh, maybe AM but it could be sideband I'll just make my mind up on the night but I'd like to get back to doing my simulcast on 160 why because I know I can so this is VK3 Echo Kilo Hotel the official station of the Astronomical Society of Victoria concluding tr tonight's transmission I want to thank everybody who's come up on the chat window there uh, from Steve, VK3SPX, Mitch, VK3ZT, Richard, VK3VRS, Cassiopeia, Bill, VK3KHT, Martin, VK7JAH, and I think that's about it, actually, all I see there. Oops, wrong mouse. Um, turn on mouse. 
Yep, no, that go away. Yep, no, that's it. Uh, also, thanks to Ian, Don, Stephen, and Andrew and Don for the emails there, which I, I shall do a, a read of uh, in detail. Sometimes I reply, sometimes uh, I don't have to, but there it is. But thanks, guys, for uh, responding to the email. Keep an eye on the Astronomical Society Victoria's website. Uh, like I say, the the website is going through a bit of a change, a bit of a refreshed uh, look. And um, uh, yes, so we'll keep an eye on the ASV's homepage for latest things that are happening. If you wish to uh, get involved with any of the sections that there are, there are in fact, in fact, there's a, a new section now. Um, uh, well, yeah, I was going to mention that. I forgot until just now. We, we, we have 21 sections that make up the ASV now. Um, in alphabet, I'll go through them. Uh, in uh, alphabetical order, you've got astrophotography, club section, comet and meteor section, computing se section, cosmology and astrophysics, deep sky, historical section, instrument making, juniors. Lunar and Planetary, New Astronomers Group, Radio Astronomy, Solar Astronomy, Space Exploration, and the new section, Women in the ASV. Uh, let me see if there's anything written there. Okay, so it's titled here, Welcome to the Women in the ASV section. The purpose of this group is to assist women who join the ASV to connect with other women who are interested in and participate in astronomy. It is an excellent way for women to help each other, share their knowledge and ideas, and voice any concerns or issues they might have in safe environment. It is also, it is also a, a good way uh, for women who might not feel comfortable attending section meetings, events or LMDSS by themselves to find out which other women might be attending. So yes, that's a good idea. Um, like I say, the, there's well over 1,600 members, in, in fact close to 2,000 uh, people and in groups involved with the ASV and uh, a good portion of them are the ladies and uh, the ASV welcome uh, with open arms to uh, our lady folks that have an interest in astronomy and the stars uh, and uh, by all means uh, come along to the society and uh, join this section and make it uh, worthwhile okay uh, but all that information can be found on the ASV website at www.asv.org.au and there it is we are concluding our missions for tonight <laughs> Won't be here next Friday, but the, the next Friday after. So have two weeks off, ladies and gentlemen, and relax. <sighs> Tonight's been... Uh, I've felt good tonight. I don't know why, but there it is. Thank you, Kim. VK5FUSE. Okay, we shall now take a quick call back on 3541. To see if there's any stations out there wishing to check in to tonight's broadcast before we completely conclude tonight <laughs> this is vk3 ekh listening on 3541 kilohertz free stations wishing to check in All right, there's a few there's a few stations that doubled, of course. Uh, what I did here was VK3GL, VK3VIN, VK3TJS, VK3JH, I think it was, Juliet Hotel, and VK3SBX. Who do I miss? Was that last one Ox Oscar X-Ray? Oh, of course. G'day, Jim. Excellent. Ah, uh, see that the the banner did work. The ASV home so, uh, website did work. Uh, good on you. All right, we'll get to you in a minute, Jim. Um, Given in Graham, VK3 GL Bunyip VK3 EKH.
very much again for the broadcast this evening there, Clint. I've listened to the entire uh, cast as, what's, uh, as well as your uh, video stream on YouTube. And I'm here to say that it didn't cut out this week, which is quite all right. And, um, yeah, some good articles in there, all, um, all well and truly noted. Been a bit busy with work this evening, so it's sort of been one of those things I've been monitoring your broadcast and listening to it uh, ongoing in the background. So uh, there we be. Um, interesting, you said the, about the uh, the solar flare. Um, I uh, I've been keeping a little bit of an eye on what's going to happen with that, and I think there may be an opportunity for some um, improved auroral activity tomorrow night. Uh, however, <laughs> a typical at this time of the year, we're going to be probably inundated with uh, with cloud cover, so probably not going to be able to see anything if it does pop up anyway. That's it too, I won't be able to spend too much time outside anyway because I'm working tomorrow evening as, as well. Um, so there we be. Um, Alright, well thanks very much for the, uh, for the broadcast there Clint. A good signal here on 80 tonight. You've been uh, constantly 30 over 9 and uh, as, as I think mentioned by some others, a fairly punchy audio uh, here on 80 metres. Not, not distorted, quite clean. Quite, uh, quite readable, but lovely and punchy audio. Um, a little, little louder than what I, I think we've sort of heard you before. Uh, thanks very much, Clint. Put it back to you there, and uh, the ticket around the uh, the others on the check-in tonight. Good evening. VK3, EKH, VK3, GL, Thanks, Graham. VK3, GL, VK3, CSJ. Yeah, I, there's just a few little changes I made uh, in the vMix program set up tonight. Uh, one of which was uh, disabling the AGC that I've been playing around with over the last few weeks. And uh, uh, but I've um, I've added actually I've, I've uh, what I've um, I've done is uh, uh, added a little bit of EQ to uh, to the system as well within vMix. Um, maybe that's what it's what's doing it. I don't know. Uh, but it, uh, I'm, I'm looking at my little digital VU meter here on, on vMix and it's well and truly, you know, clipping into the red region. So that, that worries me a little bit from a from distortion on YouTube, the audio stream on YouTube. So because I've got two streams going out, one to the internet and one via HF here. So the, one, the, the, the system that goes out through HF is a different path that, that I've mucked around with. So anything could be happening here. <laughs> Um, all right, thanks, Graham. Thanks for listening tonight, and um, and I'm, I'm glad. I was a bit worried that the the YouTube stream might have uh, uh, might have uh, played up, but uh, I didn't see it go off. So thank goodness for that. Thanks, Graham. Uh, across to you, Ian VK3 VIN in Kangaroo Flat VK3 uh, EKH. Yeah, good, quick VK3 Yeah, 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 we're, we're the expectations because it cuts through the any noise. 
<coughs> VK3VIN, VK3EKH. No, excellent. Thanks, uh, uh, Ian. I've made a, a note of that podcast, BBC, BBC podcast on Apollo 13 and uh, titled 30 Minutes to the Moon. Sounds interesting. I shall uh, go looking for it. There's a lot of stuff like that, um, particularly on YouTube as well, uh, that uh, I, I'm looking forward to uh, occasionally putting across. Uh, I might also give a plug to uh, Brendan O'Brien's Astrophys uh, website, uh, astrophys.com. I think there's a, a new broadcast or a new uh, a new uh, uh, interview um, that's just he's just released too. I think uh, I can't remember the episode number, but anyway, astrophys.com. I, I highly recommend listening to astrophys.com. Brendan's uh, interviews he does with astronomers. Thanks, Ian. I've made a note of that. Excellent stuff. And okay, thanks on the audio thing. While while you were talking, I, I did go into my little EQ setup and I did just tailor the high end of fraction down. Uh, so uh, just a fraction. You might not even notice it. Um, okay, thanks, Ian. Across to Jack, VK3TJS and Shepard and VK3EKH. Good on you, Jack. VK3TJS, VK3EKH returning. Yeah, look, again about the audio, um, I, I've been listening to the playback uh, of uh, the session here, which you can get on YouTube. YouTube does the, the favourable thing of, of recording uh, th these uh, these sessions. And uh, I, I've been listening to uh, uh, particularly this part of the broadcast, actually, because... Uh, as soon as I go off, uh, uh, you know, go to receive, the uh, audio pickup by the microphone isn't all that great. I've been meaning to to run a, a feed from the system through the mixer so uh, I can patch the audio through to the other uh, system. Just haven't qu quite got around to doing that yet. But uh, the the last couple of broadcasts, because I've had this AGC selected within vMix, the the audio is. Uh, is uh, it ramps up as soon as I stop talking? It, it it ramps up, and you hear all this background noise as well. I've, I've got a lot of fans running in the background here, so that's what I've disabled. Um, but I've also noticed that the the I've been running the uh, the cameras. Uh, the there's a a couple of microphones, stereo microphones in the camera up here, and they've been activated. I thought I disabled them. But I noticed in, in the uh, the the last a couple of Friday nights that the, the the main audio pickup is being through the microphone in the camera rather than this studio microphone this this one. So I've made sure tonight <laughs> that, that uh, tonight's broadcast is being picked up by the Heil PR40 microphone, which if you're watching the YouTube, you can see it right in front of me right now, and there's a, another view of the USB camera. Um, but uh, yeah, the audio is just one issue here, which I'm hoping to fix up with a, a better system very, very soon. Thanks, Jack. Not a problem. <laughs> Good signal from you too. The band is nice and quiet tonight. It really is uh, no, no light, lightning static worth worrying about. Uh, now I think it's Ray uh, VK3 Juliet Hotel VK3 JH. Is, I think that's correct. VK3 EKH.
No, uh, VK3JH. It's I think what I re- re- noted down. Um, uh, is is that correct? Uh, okay, all right. Well, something uh, VK3 something hotel VK3 something H is uh, is there a station there? All right, when you got to go, you got to go. <laughs> I had it down as Ray because I'm pretty sure it was JH. Steve, have a say, mate. VK3 SPX, VK3 EKH. Yeah, thanks, Steve. VK3 SPX, VK3 EKH returning. All right, not a problem. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, we're, we're in a pretty safe part of the solar system or the universe, the galaxy, Milky Way. Um, but, um, you know, that, that, that all adds to the, uh, the equation of where, you know, the, the chances of life in the universe um, all the, the, the things that uh, go against the possibilities of life of being elsewhere. But uh, the fact that there's so many stars out there uh, and so many galaxies uh, that uh, there's, uh, there's got to be life somewhere else out there for sure. Not necessarily like us, but uh, yes, being, being anywhere near these parts of the universe where there's uh, intense radiation it's uh, not uh, not a, a very likely area to be uh, for life entirety at least not, not the way we know it again okay on the uh, the signal and uh, audio side of it all right no worries all, all these notes I'm taking down so <laughs> Let's see what we can do um, thanks Steve and um, uh, yeah all right Frank, VK3 Juliet Radio. Uh, if I suddenly go off air, it's because my cat is wandering behind the desk. I can hear it. It's it's behind the desk and it's really close. She's she's really close to where the, the only mains that operates this whole station is. So if she unplugs the cord from the wall, I'm off air straight away. <laughs> VK3JR, VK3EKH. Thank you. 
Good evening to you, Ian. This is Sue with me. Uh, we must have a chat sometime soon. Otherwise, there are no missions tonight, nor next Friday night, for any, anyone interested in that. Uh, there may be early missions over the weekend. They will be on Sunday, this coming Sunday afternoon. Otherwise, uh, not too much to report. Thanks for doing it. Look for, have a good Easter. Look forward to uh, talking to you in two weeks. VK3EKH, Yeah, thanks, Frank. VK3JR, VK3EKH, no problems, dear sir. Thank you for the report. And uh, yes, I, uh, I I tried to uh, to make the the solar report sound um, uh, interesting. Um, I did check to see if uh, Tamitha had a, her any reports, but no, there's nothing new. Uh, from our space weather woman, so uh, maybe maybe uh, well, she'll probably put out something next week actually. And because I'm not going to be here next Friday, I'll, I'll miss it. But anyway, never mind. Thanks, Frank. Have a nice night. Get to bed early, huh? <laughs> At least you get a chance to tonight. <laughs> uh, now we have a special guest tonight. <laughs> G'day, Jim. Good to hear you on air. VK3. OX VK3 EKH. Yeah, no worries, Jim. Uh, just, just out of interest, uh, did you, um, <clears throat> did you see, did you, did you uh, see? Uh, <coughs> oh, excuse me, I'm losing my voice. Um, uh, the reference to the uh, uh, the broadcast through the uh, ASV homepage, or uh, did you just decide to turn on your receiver? Yeah, okay, yeah, Jim, not a problem. Okay, yeah, look, um, <clears throat> I, uh, uh, others, I'm using a second camera here. I don't think you're obviously. I don't think you're watching on YouTube. Uh, you can you can actually catch this again uh, in a, a short while. Uh, this the, the broadcast here. I, I run over YouTube as well as through Melbourne TV repeater, uh, ATV repeater, uh, but I. I I put the camera on the signal meter on the Pro 3 here, so you can actually uh, see your signal strength uh, as it's uh, coming into Narry Warren South. 
Uh, but you, you're basically five and nine and uh, peaking about uh, 10 to 15 over. So there is a bit of QSB uh, on your signal and uh, falling below nine and then peaking above nine too. So, but it's good, good readable, not a problem at all. And uh, look, thanks for, for joining in. It's been ages since I've heard you. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, we, uh, we continue to do this uh, every Friday night. Uh, I, uh, I like to try and broadcast also on 160, simulcast on 1865, but I, the transmitter that I usually use for 1865 has failed. I've got two Pro 3s, and one of the Pro 3s has decided to um, do something funny. So uh, I'm, I've just got the single Pro 3 at the moment that I'm using for 80 metres, and, uh, and then of course uh, the uh, ATV transmitter, digital um, HT high definition transmitter which um, I'm not sure if it's on the British Amazon Television Club site I don't know if it's streaming there tonight doesn't matter thanks Jim okay on your telescope too um, yeah just uh, briefly uh, I'm trying to organize a scope dome from the chaps at its idea or trading um, I've uh, put a, a fairly hefty deposit uh, on a, a three meter three meter scope dome and uh, I've still got to build a deck uh, I've got an area marked out in the backyard for it uh, but I've got to build a, a four by four meter deck and once that's been done and power's been brought down to it and all that sort of stuff uh, then I'll uh, let the guys out at Sidereal or Trading know that it's ready for installation and uh, then uh, when the dome uh, three meter dome becomes available um, they'll bring it down to install it so I'm looking forward to uh, setting up uh, a telescope finally and uh, doing some real observations of the sky from here in Arrowara and South I hope the I, I know we're affected by a little bit of light but uh, I, I there's there's a, a swag of the optical astronomers uh, astrophotographers that live in the city area that uh, produce some really good pictures of the sky um, it can be done and I'm, I'm really impressed so uh, I'm looking forward to doing a little bit of astrophotography to uh, you know finally after all these years anyway no worries Jim we'll we'll um, look forward to catching up at some uh, stage in the in the near future no doubt good to hear you thanks very much for calling in this is VKE3, uh, Echo Kilo Hotel. Um, is there any other stations wishing to check in tonight? Ah, uh, go ahead, Martin. Yeah, no worries, Martin. Um, I was, <laughs> I was, I was taking a picture of your signal um, coming in here, so um, I'll, I'll go back to my other camera. There it is. Uh, no worries, Martin. Look, no, you're more than welcome. Absolutely, more than welcome to plug uh, what you're doing down there, because um, I, I know you're involved with the uh, the planetarium down there uh, and uh, other things. So. Uh, you know that that that's, that goes right across the whole whole board. If if there's anybody uh, that's uh, involved with any other astronomical societies around the place, while we're doing this broadcast on a Friday night, uh, by all means call in and um, and give us a bit of a rundown on the uh, the society and what's happening. It is open for that, absolutely. That's one of the reasons why when I uh, run through the sheet of uh, astronomical societies around the, the country, I uh, uh, always give the, everybody a, a decent plug when I get the chance to do that. Thanks, Jack. You're a good signal tonight. Uh, sorry, Martin. You're a good signal tonight, um, loud and clear. So uh, I, I'm going to put it down to, uh, to the band noise. Um, it's not as noisy as normal. But yeah, good signal from you. No worries at all. 
All right. Uh, at uh, 11.35, I shall conclude the transmissions for tonight. Thank you, everybody, for calling in tonight. Uh, Graeme, Ian, Jack, Ray, Steve, Frank, Jim and Martin. And uh, to all the folks there on the chat window and up there on the uh, email. And uh, like I said, we won't be here next Friday. We'll take Easter Friday off. And uh, we'll be back the following Friday, 14th of uh, April, with uh, uh, at least two weeks' worth of news. <laughs> anyway, cheers, everyone. And uh, like I say, uh, visit the ASV website to, uh, to keep an eye up on what's going on at www.asv.org.au. Cheers, everyone. Take care. Look after yourselves. VK3 Echo Kilo Hotel is concluding transmissions tonight. Take care, everyone. See you in a fortnight's time. No VK9. <laughs> All right. Thanks, everybody, for watching tonight on YouTube. And I'll be very interested to know if there's anybody uh, or any other members of the ASV that are watching. Uh, please just send us a quick email to vk3ekh at gmail.com. vk3ekh at gmail.com. Let us know that you are watching tonight. Um, just be interested to see how many members of the ASV we can get here on a Friday night to watch me carrying on. <laughs> on that note, uh, I shall conclude the system tonight and uh, transmission. And uh, everybody take care, look after yourselves, have, have a, a nice Easter break. Um, to those radio amateurs that might be watching, uh, I'll be doing the broadcast this Sunday morning, the WIA, the Wireless Institute broadcast at 10.30, uh, presenting the uh, uh, the visual uh, representation from uh, Bevan, VK5BD, and repeating it again at 8 o'clock. But also, following the broadcast is the Old Timers broadcast, uh, the Radio Amateurs Old Timers 30-minute news bulletin. Uh, I'll be running that straight after the ASV after the WIO broadcast as well. And uh, Season 3 of Star Trek Picard is looking really good. That's just a plug for Star Trek Picard. In fact, all the seasons, uh, 1, 2 and 3 are okay. I, don't, I have no problems with any of the seasons. But Season 3 is, is particularly good, is good. Because you've got members of the uh, the original <clears throat> the original Star Trek t uh, coming back to uh, for a part, and some for those who have watched Next Generation of Star Trek, <clears throat> you might remember Ensign Roe, Roe Laren. She makes a special appearance, and the uh, conversation between her and Picard is very touching. It's uh, actually brought a tear to my eye. So if you're into Star Trek, and particularly Star Trek Picard, which is on the, the Disney Channel, uh, worthwhile watching. There is the plug for, for Star Trek Picard. Oh dear. And I think that's about it. Stand by for colour bars and test tone. No, there won't be any test tone. Uh, <laughs> anyway, cheers everyone. Take care. This is VK3 EKH, ASV Radio, over and out. And... Um, We'll see you in a fortnight's time or whenever. <sighs> We're out of here. Bye.